Good morning. In this session, we will take a detailed look at the poem Go and Catch a Falling Star by John Dunn, prescribed for the students of BA Part 1, English Literature, in Paper 1. Go and Catch a Falling Star is basically a song composed by the poet John Donne, who was a metaphysical poet. Introduction John Donne's Go and Catch a Falling Star, first published in 1633, is a fantastical take on a traditional and misogynistic, misogynistic means anti-women theme, women's supposedly inevitable infidelity means unfaithfulness. In the poem, a speaker tells a listener that he can look the whole world over, but finding a woman who will be faithful to him is about as unlikely as finding a mermaid or meeting the devil. The poem's rhyme scheme relatively steady meter and clear hyperbole make its tone feel somewhat light-hearted and satirical. But the speaker also seems to harbor genuine melancholy, bitterness and cynicism towards women relationships. The summary of the poem. The speaker directs a listener to do a number of impossible things, to catch a falling star, to impregnate a mandrake root, to find what happens to time that has passed, to discover who divided the devil's hoof into two parts, to teach him to hear the songs of mermaids, or to avoid ever feeling envy, and finally to discover the favorable wind that might push a truthful and faithful person onward. If the listener was born with the power to see mysterious and invisible things, the speaker continues, then he should go on an impossibly long quest of 10,000 days until he has become an old man and his hair has gone white. When he comes back from this journey, he will have all kinds of stories about the magical things he saw. But he will swear that among them all, he never saw a woman who was both faithful and beautiful. If the listener does not find such a woman, he should tell the speaker. It would be, I'm sorry, if the listener does find such a woman, he should tell the speaker. It would be wonderful to journey to meet her. But no. The speaker changes his mind almost at once. He would not go to meet this imaginary woman even if she lived next door. Because even if she were faithful when the listener met her and stayed faithful long enough for the listener to write the letter describing her to the speaker, she would inevitably have cheated on two or three lovers by the time the speaker got to her, meaning by the time he reached her. Now the line by line explanation and analysis of Go and Catch a Falling Star. Lines 1 to 4. Go and catch a falling star, get with child a mandrake root. Tell me where all past years are, or who cleft the devil's foot. The poem begins with a strange command. Go and catch a falling star. This is only the first of a list of impossibilities that the speaker demands of his listener. The enchanted world the speaker begins to evoke in these first four lines is one that is both melancholy and a little sinister. To catch a falling star is plainly impossible.
but the image is beautiful. Similarly, seeking all past years are is a past years is a fool's errand, but one whose success would be deeply rewarding. In other words, one cannot bring bring back time that has gone. Think of all the lost things and lost people that one might find in those years. There is a tension in these images between longing and inevitable disappointment. The imagination can conjure how wonderful it would be to catch a star or reclaim the past. But the rational mind knows it is never going to happen. Alongside these sad and lovely images, though, the speaker makes some rather less wistful demands. To get with child a mandrake root, in other words, to impregnate, meaning to make pregnant, a creepy humanoid tuber, is less a fantasy, more a body horror nightmare. This is a command to get involved in sexual black magic with a plant noted for its dangerous hallucinogenic properties. It also introduces a note of sexual menace that is going to be important later on in the poem. The juxtaposition, meaning bringing two opposites together, between this image and the falling stars that precedes it is jarring. Similarly, discovering who cleft the devil's foot sounds like a task with less obvious rewards. If you are researching that foot, you are not only getting pretty close to a decided enemy of humankind, you are also prying into his business and perhaps seeking knowledge that humans are not allowed. But the image of the devil's foot as cleft, in other words, divided like a goat's hoof, lightens the image up a bit. Rather than a terrifying and powerful adversary, this goat-footed devil seems more like the cartoonish figure of folklore. A sinister <clears throat> trickster, certainly, but one you might be able to engage in a contest. The tone of this devil seeking stays light and wry. However, the introduction of the devil also inflects the images that come before it. The falling star might itself have a devilish quality. A fallen star is not unlike a fallen angel, as the devil was said to be. And seeking <coughs> excuse me. All past years is the sort of thing one might seek some devilish assistance with, let alone impregnating a strange root creature. In short, these first four lines create a vivid picture of a world full not just of impossible tasks, but impossible longings. And that world brims with sexual deviance, ugly conflict, Beautiful things turning bad and lost things that can never be recaptured. Importantly, it does all this in the form of an apostrophe. The speaker is commanding his listener to go out and perform these tasks and he does so in no uncertain terms. Using an insistent trochaic meter, meaning that the feet allow followers stressed unstressed pattern, go and catch a falling star. This poem will be both forceful and light, imaginative and resigned, beautiful and ugly. Lines 5, 6 Teach me to hear mermaid singing or to keep off envy's stinging. In lines 5 and 6, the poem's meter softens by allowing for the final unstressed syllables expected of trochaic meter, whereas before there were punchy monosyllabic words at the end of lines, teach me to hear mermaids singing or to keep off envy stinging. This change occurs alongside another surprising juxtaposition like that of the desirable falling star with the disturbing mandrake root in the first two lines. 
the speaker continues his list of impossible tasks but one of these tasks is not like the other to hear mermaid singing seems at first blush to be much further outside the realm of possibility than to keep off envy's stinging that is to stop being jealous of other people the surprise of these two images next to each other might lead the reader to reflect on the speaker's own state what the speaker thinks in particularly difficult sorry is particularly difficult even if the reader thinks they might just about learn not to feel the pain of envy the speaker clearly believes it to be impossible and that suggests he has suffered from it quite a bit over the course of his life the juxtaposition with the mermaids thus becomes even more telling mermaids were known as murderous seductresses who lured sailors means attracted sailors out on the sea to their deaths with their beautiful songs and their beautiful upper halves when dealing with the mermaids one has to fear what is under the surface the mermaids here create an aura of sexually charged menace meaning threat or danger that ties back into the creepy situation with the pregnant mandrake root and also suggest that envy stinging for the speaker might have more than a little to do with sex in other words this is probably a person who has been burned by love that too badly these lines also make use of parallelism repeating the sentence structure of the two lines before them do this thing or do this thing the thematic and structural repetitions here all contribute to a growing sense of hyperbole meaning exaggeration hindi mein jisko hum atishyokti kehte hain the speaker is making an insistent exaggerated pile of these impossible tasks and the reader might begin to suspect he has got some larger point in mind a point that very well might have to do with disillusionment impossibility and sexuality line 7 to 9 and find what wind serves to advance an honest mind the shape of the poem changes dramatically in the last three lines of the stanza the pattern that will repeat throughout the poem the poem now moves from a thumbic trochaic tret tetrameter into iambic monometer which just means that there is a single iamb a foot with an unstressed stressed beat pattern per line and find what wind etc this is a forceful and unusual metrical choice especially in combination with the strong alliteration of what wind where the w sound is repeated and it gets the reader's attention something important is happening in these lines some big summing up and what's that summing up about exactly what the earlier lines hinted at the last impossibility the speaker is urging his listener to take on is to figure out what kind of wind might possibly fill an honest that is faithful loyal and truthful person's imaginary sails <clears throat> from the context of the earlier lines the reader can be pretty sure that the honesty under discussion here is sexual honesty but whose and is it so completely impossible to get ahead as a romantically honest person the speaker of this poem thinks so from the hints he has dropped in all these few lines the reader gets the sense that he might be speaking from his own painful experience there is something interesting going on in the rhyme scheme here wind in sequence with find and mind demands to be pronounced with a long i sound wind not wind this wouldn't be odd to john dun all available evidence suggests that wind was also pronounced with a flat i sound 
in 17th century English. To the modern reader, it adds a little layer of oddity and perhaps even helps to support the theme of trickiness. Wind as is the last thing that keeps a kite in the air and wind as in wind it up are homonyms presenting the same face but meaning different things. That sounds an awful lot like what the speaker is talking about when he worries about dishonesty and faithlessness. This isn't an effect that Dunn could have predicted, but he's got a good example of how languages are living and often tricky things. Lines 10 to 13. If thou beest born to strange sights, things invisible to see. Write ten thousand days and nights, till age snow white hairs on thee. <clears throat> Having completed his list of half cynical, half romantic impossibilities, the speaker adjusts the terms to his, of his argument. Okay, he suggests. Let us say that you could do those things that you had a special gift to see the invisible. He then sends his listener off on an imaginary quest. Quest basically means search here on a journey to search for something. This quest fits right in with the magical dangerous landscape the speaker has created in the first stanza. It's a lifelong quest of 10,000 days and nights on horseback. An image straight out of a t fairy tale or an Arthurian legend. This refers to Sir Arthur of the medieval times. The listener is told to spend his whole life on this journey until he is old and his hair has turned snow white. Extensive sibilance, strange sights, things invisible to see, where the S sound is repeated, contributes to a hushed, whispered sense of magic. This all feels profoundly romantic and lands on the other side of the first stanza's more wishful, image, wishful images of seeking lost time or catching falling stars. <clears throat> One would not devote one's whole life to this kind of quest for anything less than a truly valuable goal. Old age here is represented in a commonplace metaphorical way as the winter of life through the speaker's use of the word snow to describe how hair goes grey. This links back in with the thought of lost time. This process of seeking that the speaker demands can eat up a life's warmer seasons. The rhyme scheme here is the same as that in the first stanza, so far, with an ABAB pattern. The rhymes are clear and full, adding to the poem's musicality. Lines 14 to 18 Thou, when thou returnest, wilt tell me all strange wonders tell that befell thee, and swear nowhere lives a woman true and fair. Now in the middle of his poem, the speaker comes to a point. He, is warmed, he has warmed the reader up with suggestive images of sexuality and deceit. He has primed the reader with the idea of a magical quest in a world of impossibilities. He has set a metrical pattern that moves from force to gentleness to more force. And now he makes his blunt case. Even if his listener had magical powers and spent all the best years of his life searching, he would never find a woman who was true and fair, meaning both beautiful and faithful. Mixing the idealism of questing and star-seeking with emphatic cynicism, the listener won't just mention he didn't happen to find a faithful woman on his quest, he will swear nowhere is such a woman to be found. <clears throat> the speaker creates 
a complex emotional landscape. His conviction that there is not a single faithful woman in the world is underpinned by fears so deep they take on magical form as mandrakes and mermaids. And this conviction also seems to come from a place of hurt. The speaker likely feels that he himself has lost time and wasted years on someone who broke his heart. Yet all this is wrapped up in a witty argumentative and strangely light tone. He is making an argument that has an edge of dark and hyperbolic comedy. The shape of the poem helps uh, to pro support this complex mixture of moods as the speaker again switches into punchy two-syllable lines that elongate the end of the stanza with their enjambment. The speaker is building suspense and anticipation, dragging out the reveal of what all this journeying has been for. Notice as well what happens with the punctuation in line 18. Lives a woman true and fair. That is an awfully cynical and loutish comma. Maybe, just maybe it suggests there is a true woman somewhere. But if there is, she is definitely not pretty, meaning fair. This is a wall of witty defense against fears and injuries and efforts perhaps to keep off envy's stinging. Lines 19 to 20 If thou findest one, let me know. Such a pilgrimage was sweet. In the third stanza, the speaker again revises the terms of his argument. Here, he is being something of a rhetorician, that is, a trained argument maker, bringing up the counterpoints to his points the way you might learn to when you are writing an essay. So far, he has moved from you can't do these impossible things to even if you could do these impossible things, you would never be able to find a faithful woman. In this last stanza, he begins, Okay, let us say you did find this faithful woman. In keeping with the images of devoted questioning in the second stanza, he imagines that if his listener found this hypothetical woman, meaning only in theory, he would want to make a pilgrimage to see her. A pilgrimage, a sacred devotional journey, jisko hum hindi mein yatra kehte hain, kisi dharmik sthal par jo yatra hoti hai, wo English mein pilgrimage kehlati hai. A sacred devotional journey to see the shrine of a saint is a pretty strong word to apply here and fits back into the speaker's wistful idealism. But it also contributes to the note of humor, the juxtaposition between saintliness and a person who is, after all, just a regular everyday woman, gives these lines a strong ironic flavor. There is also a hint of lasciviousness in the speaker's use of the word sweet. Sweetness is, of course, a common metaphor for general goodness, niceness, prettiness and so on. But it is a metaphor, meaning a comparison, taken from taste, a very intimate and physical sense. The end of a devout pilgrimage to see this imaginary woman might similarly be more intimate than reverently respectful. The sibilant alliteration means repetition of sound of such and sweet adds a subtly lustful hiss to the line. Lines 21-22 Yet do not, I would not go, though at next door we might meet. The speaker interrupts his own half-holy, half-sexy imagining, imagining of heading out on a pilgrimage to an imagined faithful woman bringing things back down 
to earth with a bump. Never mind, don't tell me, he says. Because even if you did find this woman, I would not bother to seek her out. Meanwhile, the irony of treating a regular woman like a saint is here underlined by the ordinariness of going on a pilgrimage all the way to next door. The common modern-day idea of the girl next door might help the reader to understand the absurdity here. Imagining that the speaker wouldn't even bother to put his shoes on to go and meet the reputedly beautiful woman gives the reader a strong sense of his cynical disgust. There is another instance of clear alliteration here in line 22. Though at next door we might meet. Might meet repeats not only the initial M sounds but has consonants on the ending T sounds, might and meet. They match closely. Perhaps there is a hint of the speaker's crushed idealism in this meeting. Two similar but different things fitting nicely together is what one might hope for in the romantic relationship one went out seeking. Lines 23 to 27 Though she were true when you met her and last till you write your letter, yet she will be false ere I come to two or three. It's time now for the speaker to deliver, deliver his death blow to the very idea of a faithful woman. The speaker uses his accustomed metrical wind-up with a comparatively gentle couplet, lines 23-24, setting up the punchy conclusion. His tone is comical. Even if this hypothetical lady were faithful when you met her, he says, she would have cheated on two or three lovers before I would have even reached her. This is an obviously hyperbolic point. That is too much of an exaggeration. Two or three cheatings in the time it takes to get next door would be an awfully busy afternoon for anyone. These lines again make subtly witty use of punctuation humor. The third comma in line 27 suggests the speaker having a second thought. Having already made an exaggerated claim, he throws yet another betrayed lover into the imaginary woman's tally. False ere I come to two or three. The consonance of sharp T throughout these final lines to the biting dismissive tone as adds to the biting dismissive tone as well. Though she were true when you met her and last till you write your letter. False air I come to two or three. The poem's bitterly humorous climax gets its sense of finality from a sense of devastated hopes. All through the poem, the speaker has made more and more concessions. Maybe you can see the invisible. Maybe you could find a beautiful, faithful woman. But even if faithfulness existed for a moment, he finally concludes with a wild gesture, it can never last. This ties back into the ideas of lost time and wasted years the speaker has hinted at in the earlier stanzas. This poem is using a commonplace misogynistic trope in common in Dunn's period. But it is engaging with that trope in a way that has as much to do with deep fears and sadnesses as it does with scorn and condescension to women. Indeed, the exaggerated dismissiveness comes across as a defense disguised as an attack. With this, we end this session. 
we will continue with more details about the poem in the next session thank you